West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver NBC News and other news organizations have been keeping a close watch on the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C., where Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's grand jury has been investigating the activity of Donald Trump and his associates attempting to overturn the last presidential election leading up to and on January 6th. There appeared to be no grand jury activity at the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. today. The January 6th grand jury usually meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and so that means the next likely meeting of that grand jury is Thursday. Most observers believe that that means that Donald Trump will not be indicted by that grand jury until Thursday. But this time might be different. This time, we might not get our usual tip about when Donald Trump is indicted. Our usual tip comes publicly from the defendant himself, Donald Trump. That is how the news media and the world learned that Donald Trump was being indicted the first time in Manhattan and the second time in Southern Florida. Prosecutors told Donald Trump and his lawyers so they could arrange his surrender for arrest and arraignment and then Donald Trump, unlike any other defendant, almost immediately told the world. The first Donald Trump uh, a, a indictment that was announced, he announced he was going to be indicted and he begged his followers to come to Manhattan and rise up in protest against Donald Trump being indicted. They did not come. You might think of Manhattan as very unfriendly territory to Donald Trump. You might make the mistake of thinking there are no Trump supporters in Manhattan. In fact, 85,000 people in Manhattan alone voted for Donald Trump. In the city of New York, over 691,000 people voted for Donald Trump. More people voted for Donald Trump in New York City alone than in seven Republican states won by Donald Trump. And those millions of voters in New York City and the many millions more in the surrounding areas of New Jersey and Connecticut within an hour of the courthouse in Manhattan all stayed away when Donald Trump was arrested and arraigned there, despite Donald Trump begging them to come. Only a couple of dozen people showed up outside the courthouse that day. I was there that day walking among them and they were less enthusiastic than any New York sports fans. And it was worse for Donald Trump when he was arraigned in Florida, a state that Donald Trump won. The protest turnout was just as low as in Manhattan and much quieter, much more subdued. The so-called protesters were there because TV cameras were there and the protesters were desperately just hoping to get a chance to wave to their friends on TV at home. 
There have been no real protests of Donald Trump's arrests. None. No marching in the street anywhere. No noise at all in all 50 states. Donald Trump surely realizes by now that if and when he gets arrested and arraigned in Washington, D.C., he will set a record low for so-called protest turnout at one of his arrests. Virtually everyone willing to go to Washington, D.C. to protest violently for Donald Trump is either in prison tonight or awaiting trial. Donald Trump should know tonight that he can only embarrass himself again by publicly announcing that he has been indicted before he is arrested and arraigned. Donald Trump knows he's not going to get any kind of protest, protest turnout at all for his next arrest in Washington, D.C. And Donald Trump doesn't want a rerun, possibly a louder rerun, of what he got when he had to show up at the Manhattan courthouse again for the New York Attorney General's lawsuit against him. New York hates you! 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 That's what Donald Trump gets for letting them know that he's coming. Announcing the timing of his arrest ahead of time really only serves to make life easier for me and thousands of other people working in the news business, especially the television news business. So you got to ask yourself tonight, does Donald Trump really want to do Lawrence O'Donnell another favor and let him know now whether I'm going to have to be working on Friday night. This might be the time when we discover the old fashioned way that Donald Trump has been indicted. We might not discover it until Special Prosecutor Jack Smith reveals it in court. Maybe we won't discover it until the biggest news industry stakeout of the year at the courthouse in Washington, D.C sees the orange hair pop out of the car on its way into Donald Trump's next arrest and arraignment. That's when we might discover it. Yesterday, Donald Trump said that that indictment in Washington, D.C. could be coming, quote, any day now. Christopher Krebs, who served as the head of cybersecurity in the Trump administration, has revealed that he is cooperating with Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's investigation of the events leading up to and on January 6th. Jack Smith is focusing on a meeting at the Trump White House 10 months before the election in which Donald Trump not only agreed with the administration's security experts that American election infrastructure had been considerably improved during the Trump administration. Donald Trump actually discussed taking public credit for securing our voting system, the same voting system that he would begin attacking months later. NBC News is reporting that in that meeting in the White House, quote, officials from multiple agencies, including the FBI, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency laid out why it's extraordinarily difficult for hacking or fraud to change the results of a U.S. election. Trump was receptive to the message and spoke about holding a news conference on the topic, though he never did. Two people familiar with it said Christopher Krebs was in that meeting and has surely shared with Jack Smith's investigators what Donald Trump said. That meeting could be evidence that Donald Trump knew that he was lying later in the year when he claimed there was widespread election fraud. In the days after the presidential election in 2020, Christopher Krebs issued an official statement from his cybersecurity department saying, there is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. Donald Trump then promptly fired Christopher Krebs for telling 
that inconvenient truth, inconvenient only to Donald Trump. The other indictment of Donald Trump that could come any day now would happen in Georgia, where Fulton County District Attorney Fawny Willis has been investigating Donald Trump and his allies. The Guardian reports that District Attorney Willis has, quote, weighed several potential statutes under which to charge, including solicitation to commit election fraud and conspiracy to commit election fraud, according to two people briefed on the matter. Among the state election law charges that prosecutors were examining, criminal solicitation to commit election fraud and conspiracy to commit election fraud, as well as solicitation of a public or political officer to fail to perform their duties and solicitation to destroy, deface, or remove ballots, the people said. The district attorney is also seeking to charge at least some of the Trump operatives who were involved in accessing voting machines and copying sensitive election data in Coffee County, Georgia in January 2021 with computer trespass crimes, the two people said. District Attorney Willis has indicated that indictments could be forthcoming there in the first two weeks of August. It is Wednesday, the 26th of July of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, our little Yorkie, is the door girl, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of these meddlesome priests so we can finally get the fluffy egg dish with the velvety hollandaise sauce? Mm -hmm. There's so many entendres here. Uh, you, need, you need a quantum mechanic to uh, keep them all listed in, in order. Because that's what quantum mechanics do. That's right. Okay, so we could go off on a tangent that way, but we won't. <laughs> because Hunter Biden, last I, I know, once again, just as a reminder, we have to put ourselves in a bubble here at the mothership of Netroots Radio, where we actually produce this uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy show as well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, put ourselves in the bubble and... Uh, Hunter Biden is expected to plead guilty to these terrible crimes that he committed. Uh, a couple of misdemeanors. And uh, already, already the right wing is just up in arms because apparently a misdemeanor warrants a life sentence in this instance. Any other uh, sentence that would be normal in a normal world will be unfair to Donald Trump because, well, it looks like Hunter's getting special treatment. Yeah, he's getting special treatment. He's getting the Benghazi special treatment. That's what this is all about. Uh, the MAGA Nazi repugs have already stipulated that it doesn't matter what happens in a court of law. They're going to keep investigating. Sounds like Benghazi to me. Mm -hmm. That's all they got. And they'll haul people up and they'll throw people in uh, the slammer for, you know, even hinting that they might uh, ignore a subpoena. Unlike what we do. Oh, you're ignoring a subpoena? No problem. Go ahead. Kids. Oh, my God. It's about time maybe we uh, gave a little bit of tough love. They want to impeach Joe. Now, I'm trying to figure out what the hell they mean. Because you got, on the one hand, a guy who stole nuclear secrets. And then another guy that they've been trying to dirty up for how many years? A better course of 10 years now. And they're recycling all the same old BS that got Trump impeached the first time. We've gone through all of this. Joe had nothing to do with firing the prosecutor. In fact, what happened is that the prosecutor was fired because he was not investigating corruption, because he was on the dole, to, well, the Russian ruble dole, 
Because that's where the corruption emanated from. Because that's a mob government. And mob governments are corrupt by their very definition. I don't know. We had career diplomats that were summarily fired because they wanted to know what the hell was going on with Donald Trump trying to broker some sort of deal to dig up dirt on his political opponent. And they're talking about Joe weaponizing the government. Oh my God. The gaslighting is thick. Joe Biden is by turns the most incompetent, senile, decrepit old man in the history of politics. And on the other hand, he's a worldwide criminal mastermind who has apparently some shell companies that people can't figure out where all the money is being funneled through. Now, last I heard, there was a guy who was wanting to build a high-rise in Moscow, a high-rise in Beijing, a high-rise in uh, Indonesia, high-rise all over the place. He wants to take over golf courses and kick out people who've had generational farmland there for, you know, since the 1100s. And, and that's not Joe Biden. Let's talk about Trump's shell companies, shall we? No. The reason that we got to hear about Joe Biden and Hunter Biden's drug taking and prostitute, uh, and, and I hate that term, they're not prostitutes, they were escorts. Damn. Doesn't gallivant with prostitutes, he has escorts. What kind of person do you think we are? Jesus. Now, that's not to put down prostitutes, okay? I'm just saying. Hunter is a escort kind of guy. Now, look at Trump. He's a kind of an escort kind of guy, too, isn't he? In fact, he had a whole business in which he trafficked underage European Slavic-type girls to be escorts. Yep. Groom them in some beauty pageants, some modeling gigs. Next thing you know, they're pole dancing for uh, some oligarch because that guy's going to be uh, uh, buying some big time properties to launder his money through. Pole dancing underage girls are kind of like icing on the cake. You know, seal the deal. That's what Trump was known for. That's why he was partying with Epstein. I don't see any pictures of Joe with Epstein. But Joe, apparently, in the QAnon addled uh, brain worm that these people have, by dean of the fact that there are no pictures of Joe with Epstein proves that Joe was really in it deep. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you tell them. That's why I say, you know, punch the Nazis. You can't negotiate with them. You can't convince them of the error of their ways with facts. They don't care about facts. Punch the Nazis. And when you think that you're done punching them, you got to punch them again. Punching Nazis is like rubbing out rust. Rust never sleeps. It is a, a toxic element. You gotta rub it out. And you can't stop rubbing it out. Nazis and rust. We are Americans. We've been through this before. We had our own problem with a boomed trying to take over our government, and we dealt with it accordingly, and let's do it now. Well, actually, we could have done a lot better in dealing with it accordingly. I wasn't punching the Nazis in America. That was kind of giving them a little space slap. No, I'm talking about punching these Nazis where it hurts. And that's in a number of ways. 
I like the pocketbook. That's a good one. But there's a few others as well. And we've all been through this before. So I don't need to repeat it again. Even though I do every day. (laughs) So, with that little bit of self-confession and illumination, let us now give you uh, a rundown on what we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Yes, and starting at the top there, Loris did break it down that Trump might not do the news media the favor of announcing when he is indicted. Nope. Once again, I'm just going to say something about Hunter. He's pleading guilty to the crime of, I guess, owning a gun while he was smoking pot or crack or whatever. How many good old boys have armories right now and they're, like, taking drugs? Are we going to go after them? I thought they said that that was unconstitutional because, you know, some good old boys were smoking crack and uh, they had a gun. A gun. They had an armory. Hunter Biden is pleading guilty to these charges. And I'd like to see somebody in the Trump family step up and you know, take some responsibility for their behavior. On the rest of the menu here, as we continue in the Bistro Cafe, a Kansas judge ruled that the police practice of detaining motorists on I-70 with license plates from states with legal pot is an unconstitutional war on motorists. The GOP and the NRA want to stop the one-of-its-kind gun violence research they just found out California has conducted since 1966. And the Department of Education has launched a civil rights investigation into Harvard University's policies on legacy admissions. After the break... We move to the chef's table where a fugitive Catalan separatist may hold the key to unifying Spain's government after the Socialist Party barely beat back a Franco-adjacent right-wing takeover. And thousands of women across Poland protested outside police stations to oppose the ruthless way officers treated a woman who had legally taken an abortion pill. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit! Com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. And we thank Kelly for doing so, and she does so much more than just monitor that chat room. So thank you, Kelly. Across the page to the left from that chat room link that is monitored by Kelly Lincoln is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink uh, once a month, thus becoming a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help us pay our bills. And also, it will help uh, in the short term right now in uh, getting Kelly... uh, some uh, funds to be able to pay her ISP bill and other uh, sundry costs as well, because, you know, what we do here really does come out of our own pockets. And even though we wouldn't be able to do it without you, we still dig deep ourselves. So every now and then we need a little bit extra help. So if you could help, that would help. 
If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, etc., you can do so by going to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, and now uh, Blue Sky at Justice Putnam. And I post the show notes and links diary 10 minutes before showtime. That's where you can find the actual articles in which we are drawing such inspiration from. Yes, indeed. Follow the show on Twitter. It's just a place, man. I know. We'll work on it on the other platforms and build it up. But anyway, you can find uh, the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And most importantly, if you could pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 just not Stitcher anymore because of Sirius XM. Uh, you can find those podcasts wherever you can find podcasts. You just can't find it on Stitcher because Stitcher doesn't exist anymore because of Sirius XM. Thank you. Thank you a lot. All right. Let us now. Let us now tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it is by Toby Raji out of the Washington Post. Joshua Bossier was driving home along Interstate 70 in Kansas on a cold February night in 2019. And when he was pulled over by the Kansas Highway Patrol for speeding, the 35-year-old aviation engineer was returning from Denver after celebrating his daughter's birthday. Kansas trooper Brandon McMillan pulled Bossier over for driving seven miles per hour over the speed limit. The trooper did not issue a speeding ticket, but he suspected that Bossier, who is black, was trafficking drugs from Colorado, where cannabis is legal, into Kansas, where it is not. What happened next is an example of a policing practice known as the Kansas Two-Step a tactic that a judge ruled unconstitutional this week because routine traffic stops were being used to detain motorists whom troopers suspected of transporting drugs. The trooper returned to his vehicle, called for backup, and struck up a new conversation with Bossier in an attempt to prolong the traffic stop, according to court documents. When McMillan eventually asked whether he could search Bossier's vehicle, Bossier declined. The trooper then called a K-9 unit. Highway Patrol did not find any evidence of any drugs, and Bossier was released after being detained for nearly an hour. But Bossier, who said in court documents that McMillan racially profiled him that night, now lives in fear of law enforcement. He said the encounter destroyed his trust in police. Bossier is one of five motorists detained by state troopers between 2017 and 2019 to argue that the Kansas Highway Patrol violated their Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable search and seizure. And on Friday, a federal judge agreed. U.S. District Judge Catherine H. Vertil ruled that the practice of detaining motorists with out-of-state license plates on I-70, particularly those from Colorado and Missouri, to search for drugs is unconstitutional and a violation of a Tenth Circuit ruling that prohibits state troopers from detaining motorists based on their out-of-state residency, travel origin, or destination. In her 79-page opinion, Vratil wrote that the police unit waged a war on motorists in the name of drug interdiction. As wars go, this one is relatively easy. It's simple and cheap. And for motorists, it's not a fair fight, said Vratil, who was appointed by President George H.W. Bush. The war is basically a question of numbers. Stop enough cars, and you're bound to discover drugs. And what's the harm if a few constitutional rights are trampled along the way, she wrote in her opinion. As a result, all drivers on I-70 have moving targets on their backs. 
the ACLU of Kansas, which sued the Kansas Highway Patrol on behalf of Bosier and the other motorists, welcomed the ruling. And the Kansas Highway Patrol told the Washington Post yesterday, Tuesday, that the agency also respects Brattill's ruling. Owen Tucker Smith of the Los Angeles Times brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Last summer, the California Department of Justice accidentally published the personal information of roughly 192,000 firearm owners to the open Internet. Gun owners protested. Attorney General Rob Bonta apologized and launched an investigation. But perhaps the most surprising aspect of the leak is that the data existed in the first place. California is the epicenter of American gun violence research, largely because it maintains an extensive repository of firearms data, and unlike other states, has historically made much of the data available to scientists studying the root cause of gun deaths. A lawsuit brought by gun rights activists now threatens that long-standing data infrastructure, and although the federal government began funding gun violence research again in 2019, following a two-decades-long drought, that funding is under threat from House Republicans who have vowed to kill it. Scientists have only begun to understand the factors that put Americans at risk of firearm injury. The double blow of ending federal funding and cutting off researchers' access to California's data could set the field back years. Researchers would have to scrape by on grants from private entities and limited state funding. Academics might move away from the work, said Garen Whitmoot, who directs a gun violence research at UC Davis. The number of studies on guns would decline. Scientists' understanding of the violence that kills tens of thousands of Americans each year would stagnate. The records made public last June were gathered as part of an effort to quantify and publicize how many Californians were seeking to carry a concealed firearm in public. The state also keeps meticulous data regarding every firearm transaction, every sale, every transfer. Under California law, even private gun transactions must happen through a retailer. The state maintains a single file that records every legal handgun transfer since 1966 and every rifle and shotgun transfer since 2014. No other state has anything like it. The capacity to answer questions with that data in California is really meaningful for the rest of the country, said Cassandra Crefasi, a firearm researcher at John Hopkins University. Some of the work that California researchers are doing, you literally could not do anywhere else because of their decision to prioritize this information. For decades, senior academics outside of California actively discouraged young researchers from studying gun violence, Kerfasi said. Megan Rainey, now dean of the Yale School of Public Health, was told at the start of her career not to study guns. She was an emergency physician at the time, and a series of cases rattled her. A domestic violence victim shot by her partner, a young man whom Rainey's team saved from a first gunshot wound, but whom they could not save from a second a young man who took his own life with one of his parents' firearms. The incident struck with stuck with Rain, Ramney, or Rainey, but mentors across the country warned her that investigating the issue was too politically fraught. Scientists elsewhere envied the Golden State, 
but lacked the funding to carry out the research that was possible here. That changed in 2019 when Congress authorized new federal funds for gun violence research for the first time since 1996. With the new money, $25 million a year, academics everywhere could finally start to do what Californian researchers have been doing since before the turn of the century. And now the MAGA repugs want to take it all away. And the only question is, do we really need to question why? brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Opening a new front in legal battles over college admissions, the U.S. Department of Education has launched a civil rights investigation into Harvard University's policy on legacy admissions. Top colleges' preferential treatment of children of alumni who are often white has faced mounting scrutiny since the Supreme Court last month struck down the use of affirmative action as a tool to boost the presence of students of color. The department notified Lawyers for Civil Rights, a nonprofit based in Boston, that it was investigating the group's claim that the university discriminates on the basis of race by using donor and legacy preferences in its undergraduate admissions process. A department, an education department spokesperson confirmed its Office for Civil Rights opened an investigation at Harvard. The agency declined further comment. But White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said President Joe Biden has made clear that legacy admissions hold back our ability to build diverse student bodies. The complaint was filed earlier this month on the behalf of black and Latino community groups in New England. The group argued that students with legacy ties are up to seven times more likely to be admitted at Harvard, can make up nearly a third of a class, and that about 70% are white. For the class of 2019, about 20% of the class were legacies with a parent or other relative who went to Harvard. A spokesperson for Harvard said the university has been reviewing its admissions policies to ensure compliance with the law since the Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You're listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, strap in for a raunchy ride. While the formula for Joyride is familiar, a buddy road trip comedy featuring a group of mismatched friends, Joyride is still a first. A mainstream comedy written, directed, and starring Asian American women. Featuring Ashley Park, best known for her work as Emily in Paris, Joyride is about a type A attorney who's visiting China for the first time after being adopted as a baby by a white couple in the Pacific Northwest. Park's character, Audrey, 
Audrey is going to her native land to close a business deal for her law firm that could make or break her career. Since her Mandarin is practically non-existent, she brings along her slackerish artist best friend Lolo to be her interpreter, along with Lolo's tag-along cousin Deadeye. Upon arrival in China, the trio meets up with Audrey's former college roommate Kat, played by Oscar nominee Stephanie Chu. Hijinks then ensue with the quartet's adventures going well beyond Audrey's attempts to close the deal. It'd be a spoiler to disclose the things they get up to, but it's safe to say it's the type of raunch usually reserved for male buddy movies. In addition to portraying Asian American women beyond the usual stereotypes, the movie also takes a surprisingly touching and poignant turn in dealing with themes of identity and belonging and the conflict many foreign-born adoptees feel between their cultural heritage and the culture in which they were raised. While Park is fine as Audrey, the real scene stealer is Sherry Cola, who shines in her role as Lolo. Cola has phenomenal comedic timing and the ability to give her character depth while avoiding caricature. A good break from summer blockbusters, Joy Rides a ride that anyone with a sense of humor will enjoy. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. When you look up at the Milky Way, you're gazing at the galactic equivalent of Rome, a metropolis of stars with layers upon layers of history, just like the Eternal City. So says the astronomer Hans Walter Rix. There were glory days, there were disasters, and all of these things kind of happened in the life of galaxies. And the Milky Way is just one galaxy we can look at star by star. And so you can kind of see individual episodes in, in actual detail. Now Ricks and a colleague at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Germany have indeed gone star by star, determining the ages of nearly a quarter million stars in the Milky Way. That work has allowed them to reconstruct some of the major life events in the galaxy's evolution over its 13 billion years of existence. What it showed is that indeed the youth and childhood of the Milky Way was turbulent, but actually afterwards we've lived an enormously sheltered life compared to most other galaxies. Gas drizzled in and the suburbs grew peacefully and sprawled. The astronomers say that the galaxy's thick disk began to form around 13 billion years ago, just 800 million years after the Big Bang. Then, around 11 billion years ago, a cataclysmic collision occurred. The Gaia Enceladus satellite galaxy crashed into the Milky Way. And just at the same time, there was a huge burst of star formation or a large increase of star formation in our own Milky Way. And that suggests, doesn't prove, that the perturbance that this infalling satellite created caused a lot of gas that was in our Milky Way to form stars. The details are in the journal Nature. Now, none of this is a total surprise. People have simulated the Milky Way's formation before. So I would say really what our work has done is it just shows it clearly a long suspected picture is coming into focus. In other words, this work lays out a more definitive playbill of the acts in this galactic drama. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. What grows in the forest? Trees? Sure. Know what else grows in the forest? Our imagination, our sense of wonder, and our family bonds grow too. Because when we disconnect from this and connect with this, we reconnect with each other and build family memories we will carry with us forever. The forest is closer than you think. Find a forest near you and start exploring at discovertheforest.org. It's easy. Just put in your zip code to find family-friendly outdoor destinations near you. You'll also find guides to free activities, games, and amazing forest facts. Give the magic of the outdoors to your kids and reconnect with your family. Find a forest near you at discovertheforest.org. That's discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. 
Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. <sighs> Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. If you love them enough to turn off your music and pretend like their music is your music. Ah, oh, this is mommy's jam. Then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're in the right car seat. Let's play it again. Check today at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Act Council. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. What's the story on Supreme Court justices and ethical standards? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The Senate Judiciary Committee has voted in favor of legislation that would impose new ethical rules on the members of the Supreme Court. The proposal has come about because of the recent revelations about justices having received lavish vacations and private jet trips and educational expenses for a relative paid for by politically involved billionaires, none of which did they disclose all of which we know about only because of investigative reporting. To these revelations, various justices have responded that they broke no law or ethical rules because nothing requires them to reveal this information. And indeed, ethics laws that apply to other federal judges and members of Congress don't cover the Supreme Court, which is what the proposed legislation would change by requiring justices to abide by the same ethical and disclosure rules as members of Congress. Nothing more and nothing less which is a horrible idea, according to South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, who has announced that the bill has no chance in the Senate, where 60 votes are necessary to overcome a filibuster. As for the House, pundits say the bill wouldn't survive a vote there either. So, the answer to the question, has the time come for the Supreme Court to be bound to unambiguous written ethical standards regarding disclosure and transparency? The answer to that question apparently is no. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1990. That was the day that George H.W. Bush signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA prohibits employment discrimination of people with disabilities and requires public accommodations to be accessible. The passage of the act was the result of years of grassroots organizing by members of the ADA community and their allies. When President Bush signed the law, he said that if he had to thank everyone who had been involved, we'd never get out of here before sunset. The passage of the act had bipartisan support, but many business leaders worried about the ADA's effect, fearing the costs of accessibility accommodations to their bottom lines. While most business leaders did not oppose the act outright, they did push for amendments and concessions to weaken its impact. The business newspaper, The Wall Street Journal, called the act, quote, the Lawyer's Employment Act, warning that a flood of lawsuits on disability issues would harm businesses. In signing the bill, President Bush addressed business leaders specifically. He said, quote, You've called for new sources of workers. Well, many of our fellow citizens with disabilities are unemployed. They want to work, and they can work. 
And this is a tremendous pool of people. And remember, this is a tremendous pool of people who will bring to jobs diversity, loyalty, proven low turnover rate, and only one request, the chance to prove themselves. The passage of the ADA paved the way for fundamental changes in America's infrastructure, such as accessibility ramps, spots for wheelchairs on buses and subways, and parking accommodations. This was a major step forward, yet more work remains in order to build a society truly accessible to all. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. Because there is a lot more of us where we come from. And it is now currently... 60 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs once again in the low 90s. Plenty of sunshine, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear skies overnight with lows in the upper 50s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then sunny skies tomorrow with highs in the upper 80s, low 90s. Winds out of the west, northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Grass pollen is rated moderate right here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is good at 16 parts per million, though we still are under an active air quality advisory alert. And it looks like the, uh, oh, the daytime UV index is now very high at level 9. So that's gone up and that's not good. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.12 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 67%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that is the weather underground. Literally, the weather underground. London is 70 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 74 and partly cloudy. Rome is 85 and partly cloudy with a heat advisory. Kiev is 78 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 76 and clear. Hong Kong is 90 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 83 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 43 degrees and winter clear. San Francisco, California, is 57 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York, is 87 degrees Fahrenheit, mostly sunny and under a heat advisory, so take care. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations, that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Wilson and David Brunat of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Nearly six years ago, the leader of 
Catalonia's failed secession bid slipped secretly across the Spanish border to escape arrest and start a life as a self-styled political exile. Now, Charles Bougemont has the future of Spain's government in his hands, and I am sorry for mispronouncing his name, but that's just the way it is. An inconclusive national election on Sunday, reported on Monday, right here in Netroots Radio, has left Spain in political limbo. No leader came close to an absolute majority or was left with a guaranteed path to forming a government in the 350-seat parliament with 11 parties spread across the spectrum. Acting Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is closest to solving the puzzle after his Socialist Party resisted what polls had incorrectly predicted would be a right-wing landslide. But his party and allies on the left are still a few seats short of an outright majority. This is where Puig de Mol comes into play. Puig de Mol's Junts. Together Party, the Puigdemont's Together Party, will hold seven seats whose support, even in the form of an absten- abstention instead of a yes vote, could be enough to give Sanchez another four-year term. Puigdemont, age 60, threatened to break up the Eurozone's fourth largest economy when he made a short-lived bid for Catalonia's independence in October of 2017, Since installing himself in Waterloo, Belgium, he has been able to forge a near cult-like following among his hundreds of thousands of supporters who consider him a hero as well as a victim of what they say is Spain's quest to quash their political movement. That has helped him beat the odds and keep his political career alive, becoming a European Parliament member in 2019, even though he is hundreds of miles from the country he represents. His reputation as a cunning thorn in the side of Spain has grown as he wiggled out of one tight squeeze after another following extradition arrests in Germany and Sardinia. He convinced Belgium courts to refuse to send him back to Spain. But the price of a Puigdemont compromise may be too high for Sanchez. The Together Party's goals are to force Spain to authorize a binding secession referendum and grant full amnesty for Puigdemont and what they say are thousands of others facing minor charges. Those were the demands his party laid out before election night, anticipating a scenario in which which the Together Party could play kingmaker to Sanchez. Joseph uh, Rios, a spokesman for the Together Party, told the AP by phone that Sanchez understands their demands. Sanchez has consistently rejected granting a referendum that could lead Spain to losing one of its wealthiest regions and abandoning millions who don't want to live in another state. And that will not change now. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Thousands of women in Poland protested outside police stations yesterday, Tuesday, to oppose the ruthless way officers treated a woman who had taken an abortion people. 
The protests in Krakow, Warsaw, and some other cities were intended to show solidarity with the woman and to condemn police shaming practices. The woman, identified publicly only as Joanna, told Polish media outlets that police surrounded her and searched her belongings as she was preparing for an obstetrician to examine her at a Krakow hospital. The woman's doctor had notified the ambulance service and police after the stressed-out patient had called to report she was feeling unwell at home after having taken the pill to end her pregnancy. Officers were there when the medics were transporting the woman and also during her visit to the hospital. Police officials insist that having the officers on hand was required and not oppressive, but Poland's political opposition is calling for the head of police to resign. The justice minister, who was also the chief prosecutor, has ordered an investigation. Abortions only are allowed in Poland for pregnancies resulting from crimes like rape or incest. It is otherwise illegal to perform or aid in an abortion, although a woman terminating her own pregnancy does not break the law. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but... You do know that Roots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver